Dr. Rick Jacoby here. Sugar Crush and the rest of the story, or maybe the whole story. I'm going to show you a video from the movie Lucy with Charlotte, Scarlett uh, Johansson. Don Johansson discovered Lucy, the first primate, 3.2 million years ago. She evolved into our present day Scarlett Johansson. She evolved from eating carbohydrates to eating meat. If there has never been an iconic presentation, then this is it. If you want to look like the new Johansson, then you want to eat meat. So we're going to talk about the biochemistry of this whole equation, um, the fact that, that our diet impacts our morphology, which means our shape, then let's dig deep into this question. Don Johansson, who is now at Arizona State University with his Institute for Human Origins, discovered Lucy in 1974 in a dig in Ethiopia, and she is considered our first bipedal primate. Her diet was essentially arboreal, meaning she lived in a tree. She ate leaves and things of that nature. Then she morphed out of the trees, crossed the savanna, and I'm speeding up the 3.2 million year evolution. Then she ate fat, meat, cooked it, and here she is today. So her morphology changed from a tree dweller to a bipedal human which means she was walking on two feet. Her hands were free. Her elementary canal, which is the digestive system, shortened up because when you eat meat, it has to be digested quickly and expelled in a short period of time. So the digestive tract is about three times smaller than a primal ape like a, like a gorilla who eats carbohydrates all day long. Now, there's a lot of biochemistry involved in this transformation. But let's speed it up to 1974, where the discovery by Don Johansson, and he brought this story to me, and I went to the um, uh, conference in New York City probably about 10 years ago, and the was, subject was, what did Lucy eat? And what I just told you is she evolved to a carnivore. And we're going to talk about why that's so important. But ironically, in the same year, 1974, high fructose corn syrup was introduced into the Western diet. And our genome was not prepared to assimilate, and I'm going to use the word poison, because anything that is foreign to our genome is inflammatory, and the body will get rid of this by different diseases as a expression of our epigenetics. And what I mean by that, the genome, which is fixed, also has alleles. These are little pieces of code above the genome. So one person may have multiple sclerosis when they come in contact contact with a trigger such as high fructose corn syrup, and another person may have Alzheimer's. So we're going to talk about all those diseases. Now, another interesting fact is 1974, the home computer was born. And that is an iconic event as well, because most people thought that that change in, from a typewriter to a keyboard caused an inflammatory response on nerves and carpal tunnel was born. So carpal tunnel was not known to the Western world. In the 1960s, there were only 12 reported cases of carpal tunnel. 12. Last year, there was close to 600,000 surgical procedures in the United States alone. It's diet. So how does all that work? So when grains were introduced into our diet, about 10,000 years ago, and we morphed over to a non-carnivore diet, slowly, insidiously, 
But you know, path towards sugar. Grains are sugar in any form. They're complex carbohydrate, long chain carbohydrate. They break down to a very simple sugar. But why do we love to eat sugar? Because it's an addicting molecule. It's processed by the uh, hippocampus, which is a, in Latin means little seahorse. And that is two of them on either side of your brain. And that's where our desire and addiction center is. So why did we get this addiction? On the right of the hippocampus there, that's the food pyramid. The food pyramid was constructed by an agency of the federal government called the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. On the bottom, the carbohydrates, 6 to 11 helpings a day, is what you're supposed to eat, according to that. And I say, if you do that, you will become a diabetic. You will have all these diseases that we're going to talk about. And that's our government telling us to do that. So in that food pyramid is glucose. And high fructose corn syrup is really, in my opinion, the culprit. So how does that all work? So high fructose corn syrup is made from corn. And the corn is broken down into two substances, glucose and, and fructose. So fructose does not raise your insulin directly. It goes to the liver, it's processed there, but glucose does raise your insulin, and that is the main molecule to store fat on your body. So back to the food pyramid. On the bottom, carbohydrates. Eat carbohydrates, spike your insulin, store that as fat, and you will get fat. That's what its purpose. Now the second level up is on the food pyramid is basically fruits and vegetables. Well, initially, years ago, fruit was not hybridized. What I mean by that, it was not grown to produce more sugar in the molecule because fruit was only available in a short period of time, mainly in the northern hemisphere, and its main purpose is to make you fat. Let me repeat that. Eating fruits and vegetables are meant to make you fat. Now, that sounds contradictory to what we're taught. Well, this is how we were taught to make you fat. Good book that really enunciates that whole hypothesis is Richard Johnson's book, Nature is Out to Make You Fat. And he explains exactly how that process works. And he's correct. So if you want to be fat, eat grains, eat sugar, in any form, including fruit, and you will eventually put lots of fat on your body because you're breaking down those sugars into a monosaccharide, which is inf influencing your insulin production. So in this lecture today, and this is the one I gave at the International Congress of Vascular Surgeons just this last week, and vascular surgeons are looking at the consequence of this process. They have terrific technology to clean out the arteries. Atherosclerosis, that's what the name for that process is. And that's a Greek word meaning, athero means gunk. And hardened gunk is atherosclerosis. That's what the word means. So how does that process work? And what does it do? My field is podiatry, so I am, I, I am concerned about diabetic polyneuropathy, meaning inflammation of all the nerves in the lower extremity, thought to be incurable. And we'll get into the theory and the people who have unraveled this dilemma. So when you eat sugar, you go through three chemical reactions. The first of which is the nitric oxide pathway. The nitric oxide pathway, the Nobel Prize of Medicine was not given until about 1997 because it was not known. This was known as the um, releasing factor. They didn't know what 
and how this mechanism was working, and they got the Nobel Prize, Murad and his group, to demonstrate that nitric oxide is only expressed a couple seconds from the inside of the artery, which is called the endothelium. And it's only one cell thick. So they couldn't figure that out, but they got the Nobel Prize to figure that out. So that's point number one. Point number two is the... Uh, let me go back to that other slide. Well, point number two is the Mallory reaction. And the Mallory reaction is sugar plus a protein and equals a chemical reaction which causes the nerve to become compressed. And let me get back to that slide. And the nerve gets compressed by the same mechanism as the nitric oxide pathway. So when you have compression of a nerve by the AGE stands for advanced glycosylated end products. And what does that mean? Well, when sugar links up with either a fat or a protein or both, and then it causes a chemical reaction that causes the nerve itself to have a covering that surrounds the nerve called the perineurium. And that becomes like shrink racks, shrink wrap, squeezing the nerve. The polyol pathway causes a nerve to bring water inside the nerve. So they all contribute to this process. So the crux of this argument that I'm making today is that our morphology, our diet, our disease, are all part of this process. So how do we get from the newborn baby's feet, which are perfect, to a diabetic polyneuropathy, infection, gangrene, neuropathy on the right? And the answer is, it's the diet. And the answer inside the diet is sugar. Prior to my going to Taiwan in 1981 to look at this subject, when I was in podiatric medical school in Philadelphia about 40 years prior to that, or excuse me, 20 years prior to that, not 40 years, um, I looked at the consequences of PKU. That's a birth defect called P Phenyl keto urea. And I work with Dr. Michael Sheff in the laboratory of Ben Franklin Clinic. And I was studying biochemistry in podiatric medical soil at the time. He was my professor. I worked with him in the Ben Franklin Clinic looking at PKU. I fed the rats. That was my job. I rendered the rats and looked at their brains, put them in a what we call electrophoresis, and looked at the amino acids that were produced by these different chows. Now, looking back at that, we were feeding these rats sugar. That's what the chow really had in it. And we did produce that disease. And we'll get into biochemistry of what that all means. But the real journey began in 1981 when I was asked by the Surgeon General of Taiwan, Dr. Luke Chu, to look at why they had diabetes. And I was there in 1981, the first fast food restaurant in Taipei, the capital of Taiwan, was 1979. And they already knew that they had a problem on their hands, and it's called diabetes. And the first thing I asked Dr. Chu, I said, Dr. Chu, what is the word in Mandarin for diabetes? Because diabetes mellitus in Greek means to siphon out sweet water. He said, diabetes. I said, you don't really use a Mandarin word? He said, no. Well, that meant to me that they really did not have the problem prior to the Western diet. And that is proven conclusively. Now, I find this really interesting because as I was a guest of Dr. Chu for three years, and I taught on and off uh, in their clinics, I established their foot and ankle center at Tri-Service General Hospital and also at the VA. I didn't see a lot of diabetics. I, said a, I saw a lot of infectious disease from 
other causes, but diabetes was seeping into their um, society. And one day they had a banquet for me to thank me, and they presented these people as a ceremony for me. Now, to me, they looked exactly like what we have in Arizona, the Hopi Indian tribe. They had the beadwork, the knives, the moccasins, the dance, everything that's very similar to our present-day American uh, population of, uh, of, the, um, of these people. And I had said to a friend of mine, his name is Dan Domingo, a famous artist from a Hopi, one of the uh, third, as they say, the fir- third Mesa. I said, Dan, I saw your ancestors. This was 40 years ago. And this is before the DNA looking at uh, our ancestors. Yes, they called them Taiwanese Aborigines. That's their word they use for them. But they're really American, American indigenous Indian population that migrated from Southeast Asia, across the Bering Strait, genetically typed. They are here. They are our natural ancestors. I had the fortune in 2001 to run into this professor of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins, Lee Dellen, and he asked me a question back in 2001. He said, why do you podiatrists cut the nerve out on the foot? And I said, well, that's what we are taught. And ironically, that's called Morton's neuroma, and I actually studied at Pennsylvania Hospital And that's where Dr. Morton practiced. I just missed him by by a few years. He was there in the 1860s. And I did not know that. And Dr. Dellen did because he read the original paper. Why did Dr. Dellen read the original paper? Because he is a plastic surgeon by training. And circling back to the 60s when there were only 12 reported cases, he was the one that started to look at this phenomena of nerve compression. Now, the medical literature says it is not a nerve compression. The Neurology Society says that this is an uncurable disease. And since their training is different than his and mine, they come to the conclusion that you need to use medicines such as gabapentin, Lyrica and drugs like that to deaden the sensation of this nerve compression and the numbness, the tingling, the burning, and eventual amputation. They just mask the symptoms with medicine. Dr. Dellen is a pioneer in this field. He developed the concept of taking that compression that we talked about in the previous slides that we could decompress nerves. And he looked at the first two chemical reactions, the Maillard reaction, which is advanced glycosylated end products, and the polyol pathway. And he proved that the polyol pathway, the red center there uh, in the center, and the nerve is swelling, well, at the same time as these nerves go through a tunnel, like in carpal tunnel, it causes compression. My contribution was that I thought there was something else going on in the biochemistry of the nerve, and I proposed back in 2005 that not only the advanced glycosylate end products were involved and the polyol pathway, but the nitric oxide pathway. And that, at that time, was not known. And I had the good fortune to look at that through another lens besides Dr. Dellen's lens. And I'll, I'll tell you exactly how I did that um, with the biochemistry. But first, let's go back to the concept of nerve compression. So carpal tunnel is the median nerve. And, the, and these are just names placed on a area of constriction. We call that the carpal tunnel. So when nerves go through a tunnel, which we call fibro-osseous tunnels, in other words, there's a band around the nerve, 
and there's bone underneath. So when you compress that, that causes the nerve to be compressed, cutting off the blood supply mechanically, innervating, which is the word for the connection to the muscle, and that is its function. He proved that. He did the experiments. And he came up with the concept that that would also apply to the lower extremity. Now, let's go back to his original paper in 1984. He had a patient in the early 80s and said to him, Dr. Dellen, you fixed my ulnar tunnel, which is the elbow, and you fixed my carpal tunnel at the wrist. Why don't you fix my legs? And he said to her, that's a different disease. But he thought about it, went to the laboratory, did amazing experiments. And if you want to see those experiments, he's written 800 papers, about 80 chapters in medical textbooks. And um, he's quite descriptive on this. And you can look all this up. He's correct. And he was correct then, and he's correct now. But the medical industry moves very slowly, dominated by pharmaceuticals. So his ideas are not widely distributed. But he found the tunnels in the lower extremity. He taught me. I went down to Johns Hopkins where he was teaching at the time. And he taught me how to decompress these tunnels. At the same time, I was doing these surgeries here in Scottsdale at Honor Health. And I thought there was more to the theory. And that's when I found an amazing paper written by Dr. John Cook at Stanford. Now, John is a cardiologist by training. He has a PhD in vascular biology, and he studies one molecule, asymmetric dimethyl arginine. And he calls that the Uber marker. And that was published in 2004 in the Journal of Circulation. And he did a what's called a Cox regression analysis, which means you're taking all the factors that may add up to a problem and what is the most important factor, and that is asymmetric dimethyl arginine. So what is that molecule? So we call that ADMA, but think of it in simple terms. Arginine is a semi-essential amino acid with two methyl groups. That's how it normally occurs. But when you have high degree of inflammation caused by sugar, then those methyl groups are on one side, asymmetric, meaning on one side. And that blocks the nitric oxide pathway. So when I met Dr. Cook at Stanford in roughly 2005, I asked him a very essential question. And I said, Dr. Cook, he, since he's a cardiologist, I said, I am not sure I understand the, the cholesterol hypothesis. I really did. But I wanted to hear it from his lips to my ears. And I didn't want him to not teach me this very complicated biochemistry. And he's very straightforward. He said, Dr. Jacoby, the endothelium, the covering of the inside of the, ner uh, of the blood vessel is called the endothelium. And when you eat sugar, it makes that smooth surface, the endothelium, the lining that we talked about, it makes it like Velcro instead of Teflon, smooth. They're his words. And then it signals the cholesterol manufacturing in the liver to circulate to the area of inflammation. And that plaque that is placed down over that irritation is really the beginning of athero, gunk, sclerosis, hardened gunk. It's like spackle on the wall. Every time you eat sugar, that process is repeated over and over and over again until you get occlusion, meaning blockage of the blood flow to whatever downed end organ we're talking about. So I took his, his concept and Dr. Dellen's concept together and put it together what I call the global 
compression theory. But in my field, I first applied it to the metabolic syndrome, which is the early phase of diabetic neuropathy. And I looked at that very basic concept of neuroma, which is the nerve in between the third and fourth toe, basically. And that's Morton's neuroma. Well, it's not a neuroma. Neuroma, the word neuroma means a swelling of the nerve, but it doesn't tell you why it's getting swollen. My theory is that nerve compression is and dysfunction is a combination between trauma and sugar. And on, in the foot, certainly trauma is a factor, biomechanics. And when you have a diet high in sugar, you're going to get that syndrome, which is called Morton's neuroma. And traditionally, most doctors throughout the world cut the nerve out. It works most of the time, but is really a compression neuropathy. In other words, that nerve, just like carpal tunnel, is getting squeezed and the fluid inside the nerve, which is called the axioplasmic flow, is blocked, just like a garden hose. If you stepped on the garden hose, the water would be backing up so the garden hose would swell proximal before the compression, and that looks like a tumor, but it's not. And that's a key point. So we do not cut the nerve out, we decompress it, the same as we do there. So that's a fundamental change. So now we have not only metabolic syndrome, but diabetes causing this. Now, when we looked at this, Dr. Cook and I, and Dr. Dellen, we were calling this quartet of symptoms, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, body mass index, and all these kind of constellation of symptoms as metabolic syndrome, as if we didn't know the cause. So now we have to go back to Dr. Raven, Gerald Raven at Stanford, who came up with the term metabolic syndrome and syndrome X, X meaning the unknown. What is causing this tsunami of symptoms? Well, the answer is sugar. It's that simple. So when we understand the biochemistry and we put the carpal tunnel, the ulnar tunnel, and the nerves of the lower extremity together, I say, wouldn't all nerves be the same and all nerves is affected by the same biochemistry? Then it is reasonable in my mind that all these processes are causing all these different constellations of symptoms. When I wrote my first book, which was called Sugar Crush, I originally called it the nerve of it, how sugar is destroying our nerves. My editor at HarperCollins said, no, that's, I remember the word she said, it doesn't fit the zeitgeist at the time. This is 2008 or nine. And it, um, it's a double entendre. And I said, well, that's what I meant it to be. The nerve of it, we're talking about nerves being destroyed by sugar, but the nerve of who and what and why are we being told that it's cholesterol? It's not cholesterol. It's sugar. Modern chronic neurodegenerative diseases are caused by sugar. These are all the same disease, all the same symptoms, signs, laboratory testing. Now, this is the lecture I gave to the International Congress of uh, Vascular Surgeons. So, I glossed over this pretty much for them because they know all this. The symptoms like pain, numbness, burning, paresthesia, muscle weakness, loss of function. This is a lower extremity. They have a sign. In other words, if we tap on the nerve, it tingles. And why it tingles? Because it's starved for oxygen. It's starved for nitric oxide, the biochemistry. So it gives you a symptom of burning, tingling. And if we press on the nerve, it's painful, and you pull back. That's called a provocative sign. You provoke the nerve to elicit a response. Now, we do lots of different testing, nerve conduction, 
And if you look at, a neurologist does this testing. So what are they looking for? There's really two things. A decrease in the amplitude, just like this wire again, there's electricity going through the wire. If you press on it, the amplitude is going to be reduced. It's that simple. Just like the lights above here. If we turn that amplitude down, we'll have less light. We'll have less flow. We'll have less energy into the muscle, whatever we're talking about. And if it takes longer to go from point A to point B, then we call that increased latency. In other words, it takes longer time for that pulse to reach its endpoint. And then we have all these other uh, biochemical markers that we just talked about. And when you put all that together, I think you see the similarity of the pathogenesis of receptor dysfunction. Now, what do I mean by that? Pathogenesis means the origin of the problem, etiology, what's causing it. And how are we recording those nerve impulses? Receptor dysfunction. Now, this takes my theory into a whole other realm. And so I'm going to go through this carefully. Hopefully, you can follow along with this. So then we looked at genetics and the unity of design in the Hox gene. So what is unity of design? Most of you in the audience, most of you probably have uh, pets, cats, dogs, maybe horses, Look at their faces. They're very similar, but they're distinctly different. But they all have the same number of bones, nerves, muscles. Just about everything is the same, but they look different because the morphology, meaning the shape, is different for each species. But nevertheless, the same. That was ATN St. Hilaire. That was his theory back in the eight or 17. 90s, and he came up with that. And there also, back then, was a hypothesis that the genes, the Hox, Hox gene was also similar to this unity design, and that's been proven correct to this day. So what, what has changed? Well, the environment has changed. Our environment, and I'm focusing on sugar, but there are many other environmental factors to be considered here air pollution, heavy metals, et cetera. But the predominant symptom is high fructose corn syrup, syrup that was introduced into our diet in 1974. And redox stress. Now, what does that word mean, redox? Well, it means an inflammatory um, change. And I'll elaborate a little bit on that. So let's take a car that uses ethanol. Now, most gasoline engines run perfectly well on hydrocarbon gasoline. But for the environment, it was thought that we want to reduce that. Now, let's go along with their thinking. So how do we make ethanol? We make it from corn. We break it down to the hydrocarbon ethanol. And I always thought, why don't we, if it's so good for the environment... Why do we only put 10 to 15% of that in our gasoline if it's so good for the environment? Why don't we put 100%? Well, the answer is redux stress in a car, that would be called rust, oxidation. And we would ruin our car. But we put 80 to 85%, maybe more, high fructose corn syrup into our diet, causing the same biochemistry in the body, but we call it redux stress, which is really oxidation and is analogous to what we have in our car, which is the same thing, rust. And then we have trans fatty acids, which we have to consider because the omega-3, 6 ratio and all the fats we eat, if we go back to Boyd Eaton's book, The Paleolithic Diet, 10,000 years ago, our ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 was one-to-one. -one. Diabetic in our standard American diet is about 25 to 1. In other words, omega-6, which is linoleic acid, which is inflammatory. So when you take sugar plus bad seed oils, 
then you're going to create a very toxic environment. So following along with the biochemistry, genetics, and we'll talk about epigenetics, and the anatomy, the fiber osseous tunnels, those tunnels are throughout the entire body, and they have the same mechanism of action, same chemistry, and they also have this, I believe, the same pathology, but they look different when you look under a microscope. So let's look at the first one. This is the uh, back of the eye. And when you look at it through a uh, magnification, you see this. So what is the receptor? It's called a photoreceptor, the rods and cones. So when that is disrupted, then our eyesight starts to de deteriorate. So if you take this same concept to the optic nerve, which is behind the eyes, and cause compression. Now, remember, this is my theory, and there needs to be a lot of research to put all this stuff together. But if this is causing malfunction of this muscle and that function, you squeeze the optic nerve, wouldn't it be reasonable to say that it's causing a optical problem with a different sensor, a photoreceptor? Now, here's the foot with the diabetic neuropathy ulceration. To me, it's the same thing. It is a compression of the neurovascular bundle, the artery, nerve, and vein, and to some extent, the lymphatic. Same process, different structure, different organ, the foot, with a different um, receptor. So that is the mechanical receptor, the Meissner receptor. So just as a demonstration for the audience, take your hand and rub it across the table, rub it across your shirt, rub it across the wall. You're going to feel different sensations because when you look on, under the microscope, this Meissner receptor, that, that one is for direct pressure. So if you press down hard, you'll get more and more pain. When you lose that receptor, you will feel nothing. And that creates that ulceration because you've lost sensation. I think it's the same thing in the chemoreceptor of the nose. That's the sense of smell. What nerve is that? That is the olfactory nerve. So I'm going to link diabetic retinopathy, diabetic ulcerations, and Alzheimer's all to the same concept. So that chemoreceptor... Even though we don't think of this, this is happening to your body when you eat sugar. So what is the basic process? It's called demyelinization. It's a process. To me, it's not a disease. Uh, it is a process of dying back of the myelin sheath, which covers the nerve. And what is the nerve composed of? It has axons, nerve fibers, and covering and then we have myelin. When that nerve is compressed, this myelin is dying back. To me, that is not a disease. That is an observation, just like atherosclerosis. It's an observation. Doesn't talk about cause. The cause is sugar. So if you extend this theory to all the nerves throughout the body, whether it's Alzheimer's or uh, the olfactory nerve or the vagus nerve for MS, which is another word meaning an observation of multiple areas of sclerosis again. It's the residual effect what sugar causes, now this is all my opinion, that is causing compression of the nerve by the action of sugar, the, all the biochemistry we just talked about. But what's different? Why does one have trigeminal neuralgia of the fifth cranial nerve? or um, autism of the 12th cranial nerve, they seem like they're totally different diseases. In my opinion, no, they're not. So in my first book, Sugar Crush, I talked about that. I called it the global compression theory. Same biochemistry, all the same thing, but one missing ingredient, and that is epigenetics. So you carry certain alleles, little codes above your genome. You come in contact with a trigger, sugar. You will express that inflammation of that particular nerve. 
and we will call that whatever we want to call it. We call it um, MS. We could call it autism. We could call it Alzheimer's. They're just a description of where that inflammation took place. So they look like they're different diseases. And all these nerves go through the same process of phasing and neuropathy from autonomic, which means the nitric oxide pathway is what I came up with with Dr. Cook, and the blockage of that, which is asymmetric dimethylarginine or the polyol pathway, and that we can measure it and we can look at it, and it goes through these different phases. So I came up with this very, very expensive experiment that I did about two weeks ago in my kitchen cost, I don't know, maybe $5 instead of a trillion dollars for statin drugs to lower the cholesterol, which we talked extensively about at the, at the Congress with vascular surgeons. And I showed them this. Is it fat or is it sugar? So let's go through this very detailed experiment. So we took a nice piece of filet, beef, red meat, and I notice a lot of patients when they come to see me and they have gangrene, and I say, how's your diet? For some reason, they always lean in, look side to side and say, oh, it's great. I don't eat red meat. Well, why does your foot smell like it does? It's got gangrene. Meat is what you need. That's what Lucy ate. She didn't eat she didn't eat sugar. She loves sugar. We all love sugar. And this is what causes disease. So let's take some butter and put it in a pan, heat it up, put some meat in there. And I'm going to show you what's called the Maillard reaction in, in, in um, real time. So we have some protein, we have some fat, and we're mixing it with more fat. And if that is the endothelium, the smooth surface of the arterial wall, does that piece of meat stick to it? The answer is no, it doesn't. But if we add sugar to this concoction, guess what? There it is. It's sticky. That's the Maillard reaction. See how sticky that is? And it's brown. It's a cooking term, by the way, Maillard. And it means you're taking that protein, fat, sugar, putting it together, it makes it very, very sticky. So in summary, let's go to the crux of the argument. What does the word glucose mean? Glucose is a Greek word again. And let me just preface that before I give you the answer. Why do we use Latin and Greek to describe all this? Because we go back to the beginning of the, all this jargon, especially in the 1600s, we had tons of people with all types of different languages, French, German, English. They had a common language, Greek and Latin. And they described these things. So glucose is a Greek word meaning to adhese, to stick together. It's glue. And if you take glue, which is sugar, and place it on the artery wall, then you can stick the fat to it, not the other way around. Lowering cholesterol does not clear up atherosclerosis. Not eating sugar does. I'm going to thank you very much for giving me your time to go through this in detail. Um, if you want to hear more about this, go to my website, drjacoby.academy, and I'll tell you the rest of the story. Thank you. Thank you.